my name is Haley, and this is Savannah. Hey, guys. And we are a part of the Next Gen team here at Northville Church. Our mission here is to love God, love people, and make Jesus known. No matter how you may be watching today, we want to say thank you for making us a part of your week. As you're watching today, we would love for you to check in at Northfield on Facebook or Instagram by using the hashtag Northfield at Home. We also want to say a huge thank you to those of you who have checked in over this month. Over 325 vitamins have been provided through Vitamin Angels. Today is your last Sunday to check in for the month of May. So even if you're chilling in your jammies, you can still check in and do some good by providing vitamins to a child in need. Also, we want to invite you to fill out our digital connection card. You can find it on the app under the home tab or on the website at northfieldchurch.net slash live under the live broadcast. On the connection card, you can submit prayer requests for our staff to pray over throughout the week, as well as to make us aware of any needs in our community. Speaking of the app and website, Savannah and I wanted to remind you to sign up for our virtual vacation Bible school. We believe this summer you have a huge opportunity as family and friends to dive deeper into faith by putting focus on God and his amazing plan for us. So far, we've had over 130 kids sign up to receive a free VBS kit and the numbers keep growing. You guys, I believe that this year's VBS will be one that your kids will not forget. We have parents who've said, I think I'm going to invite my neighbors over, or who have said, you know, I think I want to do this with my kid this year. What makes us so excited about this is that there are many kids this summer who may be introduced to Jesus like never before, and I truly believe this summer is going to be one that everyone will want to be a part of. Like we said before, you can sign up today for your very own kit, today on our app or website at northfieldchurch.net slash VBS 2020. Our VBS video experiences that go along with our kits will be going live one week from tomorrow, June 8th. So make sure to register today because we have a very special pickup party this Thursday from 3 to 7 p.m. that you do not want to miss. And as always, if you have any questions about this year's virtual VBS, we would love to help in any way that we can. If there's anything that we can do, please feel free to email us at kids at northfieldchurch.net. We want to invite you to join us in worship as Josh leads us in a song called Survivor. This song is a beautiful reminder that God has a special plan for us. He is our God, He is our fighter, and He makes us all survivors. Let's worship together this morning. For so long I carried the weight of my past Crippled by burdens like stones on my back I thought I had fallen too far from your grace But you came and showed me the way When I was a lost soul searching you the ground beneath my feet I was a blind man begging You the eyes so I could see When the smoke was rising up You the air that I could breathe You gave me hope, you gave me something to believe Now I'm alive and born again Rescued from the grip of sin God, your love came crashing in And pulled me of your grace wherever I run you're leading the way you shook the shackles off my feet found redemption on my knees you gave me hope you gave me something to believe now I'm alive and born again rescued from the grip of sin God your love came crashing in and pulled me
I'm so thankful that you've chosen to join us this morning. We're about to enter into one of my favorite moments of our worship service, and that is our time of communion. It's a sacred time where we not only come together and share in the elements of communion as a church, but it also serves as an opportunity for us to commune with our Heavenly Father and recognize the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross. You see, the origin of communion actually began with the annual celebration of Passover as Israel was celebrating the sacrifice of the Passover lamb and how God protected his people. The Bible recounts that on this particular evening, Jesus had gathered with his disciples in what is now known as the Last Supper. And although the disciples didn't know what was actually about to go down, Jesus did. And as he was reclining with the twelve and eating and drinking, Jesus took the bread and began to break it. And he was giving pieces to his disciples saying, Take and eat, for this is my body, broken for you and for many. And when you take this, he said, Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way that he took the cup, he said, Take and drink, all of you, for this is my blood of my covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And when you drink this and when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. You see, communion isn't just about a piece of bread or a drink or or of juice or wine. It's an opportunity for us to be obedient to Jesus. You see, he didn't ask them if they were hungry, if they wanted a bite or if they were thirsty, if they wanted a drink. He actually declared, take and eat, take and drink. Jesus knows our tendencies. He understands our humanness and our need to be redirected at times. He knows that we need to slow down. He knows that we need to at times be still and know that he is God. You see, communion is a chance for us to stop and push pause on the rest of the world and remember the ultimate sacrifice he paid for our sins and for what that bread and that juice actually represent. The bread represents the body of the perfect, sin-free, all-knowing, all-loving Son of God who willingly put himself in harm's way and allowed his life to become a sacrifice for us. I want to encourage you today that no matter what you've done or regardless of what kind of week you've had, Jesus wants to commune with you right now. Whether you've been cruising this, the whole week on cloud nine, enjoying the full benefits of living a vibrant, healthy life in Christ, or whether you've been hanging on for dear life by the skin of your teeth, like to the last thread of hope at the end of your rope, Jesus wants to commune with you, and so do we. I want to invite you to find the closest thing that you've got to bread and juice, and take and eat, and take and drink. And do this in remembrance of Jesus. In Matthew's account of the Last Supper, it says that after they ate and drank, they sang a hymn together. 
So I want to encourage you, as you take the elements of communion, I want you to sing, to remember that Jesus made a way where there was no way, and I believe we will see him do it again.
Well, as Haley and Savannah mentioned earlier, thanks for tuning in to Northfield Church today. We so appreciate you making us a part of your week. My name is Trent. I'm the student pastor here at Northfield. If you didn't hear the good news last week, we are planning to return to in-person gatherings on Sunday, July the 5th. Woohoo! Our entire staff is working diligently to ensure a very safe and welcoming atmosphere upon our return. So, all of you need to be on the lookout for how you can volunteer to help us create that environment that so many of us know and love. Last week, Tom kicked off a brand new message series called Own It, where we're talking about taking responsibility for our lives. And Tom and I are going to be co-teaching this series. So I'm going to be with you this week and then also next week to continue this conversation while Tom takes a little break. And then he'll be back after a couple weeks to wrap up this whole series for us. If you did miss last week, I want to encourage you to go back and watch and listen for yourself. But for today's purposes, I'll give you a small recap so that we can continue today. But last week, we were looking at the first book of the Bible, Genesis. And we drew a very important conclusion about responsibility, and that is this, that you and I were created to be responsible. You and I were created to be responsible. You see, all the way back in the Garden of Eden, instead of a whole list of rules to follow, God gave responsibilities to live up to. Because you know this, I know this. If everyone did what they were responsible for doing, then there would really be no need for rules. Right, moms? <laughs> Not quite. But you see, if we take this a step further, we realize that because we were created to be responsible, it also means this. It also means that you and I, we are happiest when we manage our responsibilities well. When we take care of the responsibilities that we have when our plate is seemingly overloaded, well, there's a sense of pride that comes with that feeling. And I think that comes from us fulfilling our purpose that God created us to be responsible. And the last little bit of recap that I've got is another truth. That it's maybe a little bit more harsh when it comes to responsibility. And it is this, that irresponsibility will eventually become someone else's responsibility. Unfortunately, irresponsibility doesn't keep to itself. And thanks to Tom's analogy last week, I had the, the fun experience of Haley calling me into our bedroom and she said, hey, would you ask me to throw away this dirty diaper for you? Would you ask me to do this for you? Because you see, when you're being irresponsible, it eventually impacts somebody else. Your irresponsibility will eventually impact somebody else. So whether it's a dirty diaper or maybe a metaphorical dirty diaper, when you don't do what you're supposed to do, you leave that mess for somebody else to clean up. Now, before we jump in today, we're, we're going to start with a little bit of fun. You've probably noticed my little jar that I've got over here, and I may be showing my age just a, a tiny, tiny bit, but does anybody remember the old David Letterman bit, Will It Float? You know, it was a really simple bit. Curtain would draw back. It would reveal a large dunk tank and, you know, all the hype, all the, all the excitement that goes along with that. They had Paul Schaefer and the CBS Orchestra. I got I got me, so that's all you got. But, but I wish I had that with you today for us to experience that together. But th they would make this really exciting, but the whole point of the bit was to discover a very simple question. Will it float? So they would take an object, they would drop it in water, they would guess it will or it won't. So for us, I thought it would be fun for you to be able to play at home and for me to be able to play on stage. Just a quick game of Will it float? Feel free to guess along at home. I'll tell you there's a prize for the winner at the end when we get there. And so we have five objects. Let's see if you can guess whether or not it will float. Object number one, we've got a, a marble here, a marble. Do you think it'll sink? Do you think it'll float? Drum roll, please. Yeah, that one was easy. That one was easy. It was going to sink. Item number two, we have got 
a paper clip. Paper clip. Will a paper clip sink or float? I don't know. Will it grab the top? Maybe it'll fall in. Who knows? Paper clip. Here we go. Ah, uh, that one sinks too. Bummer if you got that one wrong. Sorry. Those of you that are two for two, we can keep going. Next up, I've got my lucky penny. Woo. We'll see what happens. Here we go. Heads or tails. Doesn't really matter. It's sink or float. Oh, and that one sank too. Now, I got two more items for you. I've got a, a little baby hand. Just a little, hello. Um, that's not weird. But a little baby hand. Let's see if the little baby hand's going to sink or float. It does. Uh, it tried, but it also sank as well. And last but not least, you know, a little Northfield stress ball. Some of you probably probably needing this in your uh, last eight weeks or so, but a stress ball, is this going to sink or float it? Ah, it floats. Wonderful. How, how did you do? To the winner of each household, I want to say congratulations. You have won a socially distant air high five. You ready? Three, two, one. Yeah. Well done. Well done. Now, we don't have to drop something in water to know whether or not it will sink or float. You see, there's actually a very involved approach to determining the outcome ahead of time. You see, the buoyant force of an object is equal to the amount of displaced liquid. That's not good or bad. It just simply is. This principle doesn't change on a day-to-day -day basis. This not like that one day something will float and the next day it's not going to float. The, the principle just exists. And if you're trying to build a boat, well, you have a choice. You can either leverage that principle to your advantage or you can ignore this principle and roll the dice. You can see what happens. The choice is up to you. And if you choose properly to adhere to this principle, well, your boat will float every time. And so today, I want for us to look at another principle, a principle that you have probably heard before. And whether you are a Jesus follower or not, this principle is at work in your life. Whether you've ever read the Bible or would you consider yourself a Bible scholar, chances are you have seen this principle at work throughout your life as well. Maybe it was through personal experience or maybe it was through the lens of somebody else's life. But this principle, much like the principle of will it float, is true whether you adhere to it or not. It is always running in the background of your life. The only difference in these two principles is the timing in which you will experience the outcome. With will it float, you know immediately it either did or it did not. But with this principle that we are going to be talking about today, you don't always experience the outcome immediately. And because of that, we sometimes have a tendency to forget that this principle exists. So you ready? Here it is. The principle is this. People reap what they sow. People reap what they sow. You've heard this before. You know this. You reap what you sow. It is as true as the principle of will it float. There's no, sometimes it'll go this way, sometimes it won't. To put it in very simple sowing and reaping terms for all of you gardeners out there, if you set out to grow corn and you plant corn, well, you're not going to be surprised when you grow corn. Simple concept, right? You sow the seeds, you reap the harvest. You sow the seeds, you reap the harvest. It's predictable. And this is what we're going to spend some time looking at today. And what we're going to discover together is that God has given us a principle to adhere to when it comes to our lives. And we have the opportunity to either leverage this principle to our advantage or ignore this principle and potentially to our own detriment. So we're going to be looking at the New Testament book of Galatians, specifically in chapter 6. So if you would like to turn there, you can if you want to follow along with, at home. I'm going to have some scriptures here on the screen for you. But if you like to read along for yourself, take notes, by all means, you can get there. While you're turning there, in case you're not familiar with the Christian Bible, Galatians actually isn't a book. It's a book for the organizational makeup of the Bible. But Galatians was actually a letter written by a man named Paul. Paul was a huge influencer of the Jesus movement throughout the early church. He had an incredible encounter with Jesus, and his life was forever changed, much like you and me. And he went on to plant numerous churches all throughout what we know as the Middle East and Central Europe. And this specific church in Galatia, in which he wrote this letter, is located in what we know as modern-day Turkey. Now, before we jump straight into this whole principle of you reap what you sow, 
I want us to walk together in the verses that lead up to this principle so that we can all understand the context in which Paul was speaking. So, Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 3. Paul says this, If any of you think you are something when you are nothing, you deceive yourself. If any of you think you are something when you are nothing, you deceive yourself. You see, Paul begins to speak to a tension that, that we all have, and that is there are times when we try to play this comparison game. There's a danger that comes with comparing yourself to other people. It's easy to say, oh, well, look at me. Like, I've got it going on compared to such and such. You know, I, I, I'm the man around here, but there's a danger in here because we can deceive ourselves because the inverse is true as well. We look at people who are seemingly doing better than us and we'll often make excuses. We say things like, well, you know, if I had their resources or if I had their opportunities growing up or, or if I had started when they did, then, then I would be where they are instead of where I am right now. And Paul is addressing this. He says, this is a warning label. You are deceiving yourselves in the context of comparing yourself to other people. He goes on and he says, each of you should test your own actions. Each of you should test your own actions. Essentially, you need to recalibrate your focus here. Don't pay any attention to what somebody else is doing. You need to focus your efforts and pay attention to your actions, to your reactions, to your decisions as they pertain to your life. Quit looking out the window of your life and start looking in the mirror of your life. Because he goes on, the verse continues. He says, then you can take pride in yourself without comparing yourself to somebody else. And this word pride here, I know when we see this word, it's oftentimes that, that, that it comes with a negative connotation. But what he's saying here is you can take pride. You can be proud of who you are. This is a direct contrast of comparing yourself to others. He says, if you compare yourself to you, you know what's going to happen? You're going to be proud of you. And this is not the bad kind. Again, this is a positive side. This is the, a good feeling about who you are and where you are in life. And that's what we all strive for. And this is what we talked about last week. This is what it feels like to own your life. And what I love about this, that Paul is saying, he says, this is possible for you. This is possible for you. If only you would stop comparing yourself to others. Because as long as you continue to compare yourself to others, you will continue to make excuses. However, when you begin to compare yourself to yourself, you will always make progress. I see this all the time at the gym. You, you often see this on the golf course. I love playing golf. It's a game that I'm not good at, but I love going out with friends. I love going out and playing with other people. And, and before, I, I used to be tempted to compete with my friends. I used to be tempted to compete with them, but, but golf's not really a sport, at least for me, that, that I could really compete with other people. It was really... How can I get better for me? And the same goes with practices of health. It's easy to look at what somebody else is doing at the gym and go, man, I wish I could be that strong. I wish I could be that fast. I wish I could do all these things. But in the reality, if you focus on your game, if you focus on your effort, do you know what you'll do? You'll make progress. You'll make progress. You'll get better than where you were before, not because of what somebody else is doing, but because you are focused on, on you. And Paul says this. He says, for each of you should carry your own load. Each of you should carry your own load. You've all got responsibilities in life. You all have a piece of your life that you need to own. And you see, each of you have a load that you carry. Everyone has their own set of responsibilities when it comes to their lives. Although they may be the same in nature, they're different for each of us. And here's what I mean by this. All of us have family responsibilities. Whether you're married, not married, you have kids, you don't have kids, if you're single, all of us have family responsibilities. But every family looks different. All of us have financial responsibilities, but everyone's financial situation isn't the same. We all have relational responsibilities, but relationships, they're unique. They're unique to the people that are involved in the relationship. But see, there's a temptation to take our eyes off of the responsibilities we have and to place them on somebody else's responsibilities, to place them on somebody else's life. And don't miss this. Each of you, each of you in your state right now, whether you feel great about where you are or you feel a sense of discontentment with where you are right now, each of you have something going for you 
that someone else wants. Each of you have your own opportunities. Each of you have your own potentials. Each of you have your own natural giftedness that others are going to be tempted to compare themselves to you. But when you continue to compare yourself to others, you will run the risk of missing those within yourself. Now, brace yourself. Because coming next is where Paul just really gets down to the point of this whole set of verses. Some people call this dropping the hammer. Some people view this as just telling the truth and love. And if there is one thing that you will learn about Paul is that he is not afraid to tell the truth in love. So you have been warned, okay? In verse seven, Paul says, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. It's funny, he brings this up again. He goes, I know this is something that you're good at. And if we're gonna get down to the root of our hearts and where we lie, we realize, yeah, this is something that we're good at. I'm good at making excuses and not necessarily making progress. I'm good at comparing myself to others. But he says, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. God cannot be mocked. You think, well, I've never, I've never tried to mock God. That, that, seems, that seems a little excessive. That, that doesn't sound like something that I would do. And Paul says, look, You may be able to pull the wool over somebody's eyes in your life, but it don't work like that with God. Growing up, you may have been able to fool mom. You may have been able to trick dad, but I can tell you this, you don't trick God. You don't fool God. It's not that he's going, oh, you you got me on this one. No, God doesn't work that way. And and I can't believe that I'm about to tell this story on camera, but I I think and I'm hoping that there's at least a statute of limitation that would protect me from any additional punishment. But I'm gonna go ahead and just preemptively apologize to Miss Green, my, my ninth grade science teacher, and to my father who is probably watching this live stream. I regret this decision that I made over 15 years ago, and I want you both to know that I have grown since this incident. But here goes. When I was in ninth grade, I had a 70 on my progress report in my natural science class. At my school, a 70 was one point away from a failing grade, and unfortunately, anything below a C had to be signed by a parent and returned to the teacher. And then, to make matters worse, if you go three days without returning the signed progress report, it would result in detention. Well, I received my progress report on a Friday, which is the worst day to get a progress report, and I had the expectation that it would be returned and signed on Monday to Ms. Green. Well, Monday comes around, guess what? No signature. Then it's Tuesday, guess what? Still no signature. Now, in hindsight, if I was owning my life, the responsible thing to do would have been to face the music and to have my dad sign my progress report. At 29 years old, I know this to be true, but 13-year-old Trent had a better plan, or at least he thought he did. You see, Tuesday night was always pizza night with me and Pops. We would go to Sir Pizza every Tuesday because it was two for one pizza night and that was just our thing. And on this particular Tuesday, I had something on my mind, but I was terrified to bring it up. I had my progress report in my pocket and then I had what I thought was the greatest idea of all time. Quick fix, no harm, no foul. I was going to forge my dad's signature. All it took was a little stroke of the pen. Miss Green probably didn't even know what his signature looked like. But then I thought, well, maybe he signed something before and she would cross-reference like, okay, either way, I'll figure this out. Boom, problem solved. Like, guess who's going to be strolling back into class with a signed progress report? This guy, no problem. So what did I do? I swiped the customer copy of the receipt that my dad signed and I laid my progress report over top of the receipt and I traced it in pencil so that I could get that outline. And then I took a pen right over top of it and then erased all the lines that were outside of the pen. No one was the wiser. Perfect signature. In hindsight, I probably could have used that power for more than just a signed progress report. Probably could have gotten a little bit more out of the deal, but that's not really here or there. There's an unexpected kink in my plan that actually resulted in me getting caught anyway. Uh, That's a different story for another day, and it probably fits in really well because, you see, what matters here is we often think that just because we can pull one over on those around us that we can treat God the same way. We think we can fabricate versions of stories or, or we can manipulate things to make it look better than they really are, and we think we can make excuses to justify ourselves and the reasons we aren't making progress in all these particular areas, and we think that this gives us a license to treat God the same way. 
But in Paul's not so subtle reminder, he tells us this. He says, God can't be mocked. You may think you can get away with it with your earthly people, but God sees this. God knows this. God watches all of this unfold. And you, you may have been able to pass off responsibility and your parents may have been able to fill in the gap for a long time. And there may be circumstances where you're able to to just be irresponsible and get by, but Paul's words here can be looked at a few different ways. They can be viewed as a warning. They can be viewed as an opportunity or they can be viewed as a promise. God cannot be mocked. And your irresponsibility, when it comes to your finances, when it comes to your morality, when it comes to your relationships or whatever the case may be, it's not a mystery to God. And then Paul gets back to the principle that we started with today. He says, God cannot be mocked because people reap what they sow. People reap what they sow. It's not good or bad. It just is. And Paul says that what each of us intuitively know, and that is that life is connected. Where you are today is a result of the decisions you made yesterday. And where you will be tomorrow is ultimately made up of your actions today. You see, there is a relationship between your current irresponsibility and what you can expect in the days, weeks, and months to come. And likewise, there is a relationship between your current responsibility and what you can expect in the days and weeks and months to come. The tension that we face when it comes to this principle oftentimes isn't in the sowing. Typically, the tension comes with the speed of the reaping. You see, we have the ability and the opportunity to sow something every day. Every day, whether you are owning your life or if you're going in the other direction, you are sowing something. Every action, every decision, all of it falls under the sowing category. However, we don't always get to dictate the time of the reaping process. The result of the reaping process is up to us. We said it earlier, if you want to reap corn, sow corn. You will not be surprised by the result. However, the timing The timing is not always as predictable as something like growing corn. There's not a defined scientific process to the timing in which we reap in today's world. And chances are, if there were a word that could accurately describe when you reap the harvest, it would be later. It would be later. Later than you thought it should be here. Later than you thought you deserved it to come to you. And you see, later is why you and me, it's why we can't give up on doing the right thing. But unfortunately, later is why we end up giving up on doing the right thing. I did everything right on Monday, yet my Tuesday was still a disaster. Well, it's because the speed of the reaping process isn't up to you. I I know I sat around in quarantine for the last eight weeks doing nothing, but Like, I've been walking every day for a week. Like, why why don't I have a six-pack yet? Speed's not up to you. I've been emotionally unavailable to my spouse for the last five years. I don't know why when I went out of my way to do this nice thing that they they weren't appreciative. Sure, you know, I may have worked a little bit of overtime in my day. I I don't know why my son or my daughter doesn't believe me when I say I'll be there this time. You see, we trick ourselves into thinking that just because we've changed what we are doing today, that it will instantaneously adjust our current reality. The truth is, if you've been sowing a certain way for the last eight weeks or the last eight months or the last eight years, well, you're not gonna adjust the harvest in just one day, in one week or one month or even one year. And this principle applies to multiple areas of your life, your finances, your relationships, your reputation. The list can go on. The principle can still apply. And if there were any area in your life in which you are experiencing some discontentment or you think you should be further along than where you are right now, well, chances are you have sown and reaped your way there. 
whether it's finances or relationship, your health, whatever the case may be, chances are you have sown and reaped your way there, at least in some capacity. And I know there are always going to be outside forces. There's always going to be the unexpected bumps in the road. And that's just life sometimes. But as we talk practically, as we kind of hone in on where we're going today, and, and we talk about how this truly affects our lives, I want to refer to a question that Tom introduced last week. A question that may be simple to ask, but difficult to hear the responses. The question was this, what is it like being on the other side of me? What is it like being on the other side of me? Chances are we have an answer to this question for ourselves. Chances are we know how we would answer this question. However, if you were to actually ask someone this question, you might receive an answer that you weren't expecting. Because after all, irresponsibility is easy to detect in someone else. However, irresponsibility in our lives is easily justified, easily excused, and easily pushed away. So, when you begin to look in the mirror and you really take a closer look at some of those areas in your life that you maybe aren't proud of or that you wish you could change, if you were to create a pie chart of all of the chaos that you are experiencing in your life, the temptation would be for you to attribute blame. And once you get that out of your system, because that's normal, we all do this. But once you get that out of your, out of your system, you're going to be left with a slice of pie that you can't pass off on anybody else. And for some of you, it might be a big slice of pie. You know, the, you know the slice I'm talking about. I'm talking like Thanksgiving Day, already changed into my stretchy pants, big slice of pie. For some of you, not so much. But regardless, our next step is the same. Our next step is the same. And step one is we've got to own it. We've got to own our slice of the pie. We've got to own up to the mistakes that we have made. Yes, I know she was in the wrong. Yes, I know that he messed up. I know that it's not fair. I know your boss doesn't do what they are supposed to do. I know your teacher mistreats you. But you have a slice of the pie too. And no matter how much you wish you could change the other party's actions, you can't. But you can control yours. You can control your responses and you can be responsible for your slice of the pie. You can either continue to make excuses or you can make progress. And progress starts with owning it, owning your mistakes, owning your shortcomings, owning the part that you played in whatever mess has been made. And this takes some serious vulnerability. This takes some major honesty on your part. But if we are going to stop deceiving ourselves, then what we need to do is we need to own our slice of the pie. If we want to start leveraging this principle to our benefit, then we need to go back to what Paul said. We need to carry our own load and we need to take responsibility for our own actions, knowing that when we do, we will move forward. We quit blaming, we quit excusing, and then comes the next step. You see, step two is you start doing what you should have been doing all along. Start doing what you should have been doing all along. Step one is easy. Owning your slice of the pie is easy. It may hurt for a minute, but after a while, it's done. Owning up to what got you in the mess in the first place, no problem. But this next step, this is where the rubber meets the road. You need to begin doing what you should have been doing all along whether it's with your finances, whether it's with your health, whether it's with a relationship, whether it's with a strained relationship, you got to start doing what you should have been doing all along. And notice what Paul says in verse 9. He says, let us not grow weary of doing good. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. We will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You own your share of the responsibility. And then you begin doing what you should have been doing all along. This is what it looks like to leverage this principle to your advantage. It doesn't discriminate. It doesn't pick at random. This is a principle that you can use and you can leverage to your life. 
Just like you don't have to wonder, will it float? Will it sink? You don't have to guess on that. You don't have to guess whether or not your actions will cause your life to sink or float. You can know ahead of time. So let us not grow weary of doing the next right thing. For at the proper time, not our time, at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Hear me on this. Take this principle seriously. Take this seriously. Because at some point, this principle will either bless you or it will catch up with you. This principle will either bless you or it will catch up with you. It starts with focusing on your load. And do you know what the best part of your load is? The best part is you don't have to carry it by yourself. Jesus tells us in Matthew 11, he says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Friends, church, hear me. Don't give in to the temptations that come from weariness. Don't take the shortcut. Don't take the excuses. Don't stop doing what you know you should be doing. Rather, you can take refuge in the one who carries the load with you. Let me pray for you. Father God, I'm I'm thankful for this principle that you have given us. A principle that, that for oftentimes in our lives we see looks like it's working against us, but God, I know that you gave us this principle out of love. You gave us this principle to show us that there is a way for life to go well, and there is a way for us to really and truly own what that looks like. And the reality is, that looks like living in your will. So God, for, for those of us today who feel the weight of this principle, for those of us today who know it's time to own my slice of the pie, and it's time for me to begin doing what I should have been doing all along. God, will you give us the wisdom to see those areas of our lives? Will you give us the wisdom to see and to experience those areas of our lives? And God, will you give us the courage to take a step out in faith to begin doing what we should have been doing all along. God, I'm thankful for your reminder that when it gets too heavy for us to carry on our own, you remind us that we do not carry it by ourselves because we have a Savior, Jesus, who came to this earth and he walks it with us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I hope you'll come back next week as we continue this conversation. And look, I I know, I know the future is full of unknowns and where there is unknown, there is ultimately fear. But as we'll be reminded in this next song, our fear, our fear doesn't stand a chance in comparison to the one who walks with us. May this song be a reminder to you that you don't walk alone. I love you. I hope you have a great week. told you you're not good enough when he told you you're not right when he told you you're not strong enough to put up a good fight when he told you you're not worthy when he told you you're not loved when he told you you're not beautiful you'll never be enough
your fire fall and cast out all my fears. Let your fire fall, your love is all I fear. Let your fire fall and cast out all my fears. Oh, let your fire fall, your love is all I fear. Oh, let your fire fall and cast out all We want to thank you for joining us online today. I know you have plenty of options on how you can spend your Sunday mornings, and we are so grateful that you have chosen to spend a part of yours with us here at Northfield. Now, I realize some of you may be bummed right now to be looking at my mug instead of our local celebrity baby, Jack, and I can't say that I blame you. I actually thought about trying to carry my 16-year-old son, Ryman, up here on my hip and feed him a donut, but he's almost six foot tall, and let's be honest, that would be a little weird for some of you. I mean, not for me. I like a little awkward every okay, now and then. I think okay. it'd be funny. Oh. Okay, moving right along. Moving a right few along. reminders before we go. Jimmy Sight's study on Psalms 23 is tonight at 6 p.m. You can watch it on our Facebook page or on our website. And we have absolutely been blown away by the positive response that we've received in regards to our virtual VBS experience that we have planned for this summer. We've loved seeing how families are reaching out in their neighborhoods and inviting others for, to join them along in the journey. Our amazing NextGen team have created personalized boxes for each child, so please be sure to register for VBS today at northfieldchurch.net forward slash VBS 2020. We're also gonna be having a very awesome VBS box pickup party on June 4th from three to seven. And we cannot wait to see you guys in person. And if you have any questions in regards to VBS, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or any member of our next gen team. We're here to help you guys in every way that we can. It is because of your generosity and giving each week that we can continue to meet not only the needs of the people in our church, but the people in our community as well. If you would like to give this morning, there are three ways you can do so through our app, through our website at northfieldchurch.net forward slash give or even by mail. Oh, and one more important thing before you go. Northfield Church and the American Red Cross are hosting an upcoming blood drive. The Red Cross has implemented new and additional safety precautions to ensure donors and staff stay safe. The need for blood is constant and only volunteer donors can fulfill that need for patients in our community. Please join our life-saving mission and schedule an appointment today. You can get all more, the more information on our website about the blood drive. And thank you again for partnering with us as we seek to love God, love people, and make Jesus known. Have a great week, everybody.